Namaskaram. Namaskaram to all of you, wherever you are, and a wonderful morning. Here in Tennessee at Triple I, we're really having an absolutely wonderful morning. Whatever the time of the day for you, wherever you are. Well, tomorrow is uh, the full moon or the Pavnami. Mm. I was thinking of August, but uh, for various reasons, we have pushed it to September. But uh, from beginning of September, <coughs> or end of August, maybe, when the Mavasya or the new moon day comes, we will open both the centers, triple I here in Uni United States and uh, Isha Yoga Center in India. For sadhana, for people who wish to pursue this, a minimum period will be twenty-one days. Well, we will craft a certain sadhana for you which will do wonders for you. Now that the world is in lockdown in many ways. If not you're totally off, at least you're partially off. This is a good time to enhance yourself, to invest some time and energy upon yourself. When I say yourself, I'm not talking about improving your skills, I'm not talking about improving your job competence, your relationships with people, those things. I think you had enough time to do those things. I'm talking about enhancing this life. We can… all of you know you can strengthen the body with a certain amount of involvement. You also know that uh, you could sharpen and strengthen your mental structure, bring balance to your emotional structure, these things you know. Well, though you know these things, many of you may not have either the tools or the atmosphere or the determination and commitment to do it. So that also can be addressed, but I'm talking about enhancing the life process, the life itself. Because yoga is not about improving your body. Well, that is a consequence. One of the happy consequences of yoga is <laughs> you have a resilient body. Uh, Either you will get a sharp mind or become nothing like me. <laughs> Emotional balance, enhancement of whatever we do in our lives, all these are very happy consequences but not the purpose of yoga. The purpose of yoga is to make this life burst in such a way that you cannot make out which is you and which is not you. That's union. Yoga means union. For this, you need enough life energy within you. You need an effervescent bursting forth energy within you, life within you, so that body cannot contain it. If you are a feeble piece of life, you are not even able to supply enough energy for the body. Well, mental activity is pulling people down. Everybody is talking about, unfortunately, about mental pandemics, suicide pandemic, all kinds of theories are being proposed. And unfortunately, many of them may come true because people have not even invested themselves even to take charge of their own faculties. It amazes me 
people are fifty, sixty years of age, still they don't know how to handle their thought and emotion. When are you going to learn? <laughs> when <laughs> you have a million year lifespan, what is it? It is like, let us say you're fifty years of age, I'm using fifty not to insult many of you who are here, but uh, as a halfway mark, I'm saying. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> let's say you're fifty years of age, but you don't know how to use your hands. What should we call you? You have normal hands, but you don't know how to use them. We will call you a hobo. If you do not know how to use your thought, how to use your emotion for your well-being, and once in a way your hand pops up and slaps you in the face, then definitely you're nuts. I know these are bad words to use today, not politically correct, socially correct, but otherwise how to get it across to you? Fifty years if you didn't get a point, you think it can be made gently to you? Hello? <laughs> Fifty years of living here on this planet, if you still did not understand how to use your thought, how to use your emotion to keep yourself well, if you did not understand how to use these two hands so that they don't come and slap you in the face, well, it can't be done gently, that's all I'm saying. So, all these things are important, but you want to uh, improve in installments or you want to just burst forth as a life, which is beyond various limitations, if that needs to happen, you need to enhance this life. I've been <laughs> I think many of you are familiar, I've been using this analogy of a bubble. You blow soap bubbles. Like that, this is a bubble. Well, the size of your body does not determine the size of the bubble. The size of the bubble is determined by how much life energy have you captured? Because what we are referring to as life is not just invested in this, it is here, out in the air, it's in the tree, it is in everything, it's in the entire cosmos. This is a living space. We have captured a little bit and fortunately creation has given us, out of its magnanimity, given us an individual experience. This individual experience, instead of becoming a great possibility, has constipated the whole humanity because most people have misunderstood their individual experience as individualism. As there are many isms, many dogmatic religions which tell you this is it, Individuals are just another religion. Some have gathered a few people around them, some lone warriors. Because an individual is a dogmatic nonsense. Everything is hundred percent. This is what I like, this is what I dislike, this is a, this is whom I love, this is whom I hate, everything is determined. Well, you're a bloody religion. When I'm saying bloody religion, not with any disregard for any religion, because you will bleed, <laughs> that's all. You will injure yourself and you will bleed, there's no question about that. So, enhancing the life itself is what the purpose of yoga is. The marketing jargon, unfortunately we have to put out, your headache will go, your backache will go, your immunity will come up, you'll fight the virus better. <laughs> Even when there was no virus, yoga was still relevant because it's about life. It's not about virus, 
It's not about not going to the hospital. It's not about, for the first time, being negative is good. <laughs> so, if you're interested, I think both the centers together can house a thousand people or a few more than that. Twenty-one day batches, you can come, we will open this up. I've not even told our teams to work out the modalities, but uh, you know, tomorrow is Pavnami. I was just thinking, August moon, we shouldn't miss it, but uh, we did not announce it. Some logistics have to be prepared and some protocols have to be set so that uh, people don't bring virus into the center. Probably these two centers have been the safest havens for people because both here and in India where there are nearly four, four thousand people, we have not had a single infection till now. So uh, we want to keep that, so there will be protocols, but even those uh, periods can be used for sadhana. Those of you who feel that you could do with enhancement of life, should do this twenty-one day. What does enhancement of life mean? See, uh, at least in this weather, you can distinctly see it, everywhere you can see it if you have eyes. But, uh, you know, many of you uh, are sparing it because when you go to heaven, you want to see everything clearly. <laughs> so, <laughs> not seeing anything here so that it's well rested. <laughs> uh, because of that, you may not see it otherwise. For example, from winter to spring, there's a whole enhancement of life, a burst of life happening. Not just leaf and flower and fruit, just life itself bursting forth. Well, if you didn't feel that, at least you can see that something is stimulating life. No, no, Sadhguru, we know all the signs. That is because uh, from uh, winter solstice, we are moving up towards summer. Because of that, because of sunlight, leaves are coming out, photosynthesis happening. Well, you're a textbook scientist, you know nothing about life. Do not think these kind of rudimentary explanations about everything contains life. Yes, it's factually true, I'm not questioning that. But you know, you don't have any fundamental answer for all the life that's bursting forth on this planet or elsewhere for that matter. Because right now, some of the official agencies of United States is confirming that uh, they have found remnants of UFOs. Where they came from, they don't know, but definitely something that doesn't belong to this earth, they have found remnants of that, they're confirming that now for the first time, from the time of Roswell to now. It's a long time, but confirmations are coming at last. Uh, this is uh, because of competition with other nations, uh, because they may announce any time. <laughs> Unfortunately, we are not self-stimulated to do our best. Always there must be somebody running little faster than us, we want to beat that guy. Well, unfortunately, I'm sorry, not saying this with any... Uh, I'm not joking about it. Unfortunately, definitely United States is beating the whole world in terms of both infections per day, 70,900 infections per day and nearly 15,000 deaths in 24 hours. Mm. Beating the world, this is not the way to beat the world. This is not the way to be on top of the world either. Unfortunately, it is happening. Well, other countries are uh, doing their best to catch up. Brazil is right behind India, galloping fast and uh, could be in the tops anytime. Uh, there are up and down trends that nobody knows why. Suddenly some cities are dropping, some cities are going up, no clue. 
all contact tracing, this, that, everything they did for four months in India very diligently, forcefully. But uh, administrations are slowly losing control. Where are the infected people? Where are they running away? Some of them are jumping off the hospital wards and running away somewhere. Uh, all these con things are happening, I'm sure it's happening everywhere. Probably much more here than anywhere else. But the unfortunate reality is, we are still not conscious enough, disciplined enough as a generation of people with all this technology, with so much enhancement and information, everybody knows what it is, but still we are not able to do what is needed. So twenty-one days if you withdraw into sadhana, you could even save the world. <laughs> yes. <laughs> not just enhancing your life. Enhancing your life, what it means is, the life that you are, the life energy that you are, should be at least little more than your body. Well, don't think you have to enhance the body for this, because <laughs> uh, body may compete with the life energies and also try to become like that. No, yoga means your life energy is always beyond your body. This is why there is an experience of that which is not physical in nature. Essentially, if we have to technically define what we are referring to as a spiritual process, essentially it simply means your experience of life is not limited to your physical nature. Something more than that is happening to you. If that something more has to happen, there are many, many, many ways of doing it. But the fundamental thing is in some way, you have to make the life process more significant than the physiological process and the psychological process. Well, you're carrying a, you know, we ordered for clouds today so that everybody's in shade, but you're carrying a cloud of your own all the time. Uh, generally, at least in this part of the world, not so much in India, but in this part of the world, a cloudy day is considered a dull day. In India, a cloudy day is seen as a pleasant day. <laughs> so, cloud essentially means something is blocked out, which is the basis of life here. Sun, the solar energy, is the basis of life here. When I use these words like solar energy, a whole lot of people are thinking of solar panels. No, these are all solar panels. The best designed solar panels that we have, we know or we are yet to create anything like this, this is a solar panel. Every life is a solar panel. Without sun's energy, nothing here will happen. So blocking that is considered in some way against life process and it is. Yesterday I was talking to our Ishangas and I was just telling them, you know, summertime when it feels hot, you feel, I wish it was... Yeah, I wish he was a little cooler. What is he? Simply burning away like this. Well, I'm, I'm just making a guess, this is not some scientific fact. I guess that, let's say sun decided, to reduce his intensity by ten percent. Probably twenty-five percent of the land mass will go under ice. Let us say he decided he will reduce his intensity by twenty-five percent. Most probably over fifty percent of the land mass will go under ice. Well, I may not be correct on the numbers, but something like this will happen for sure. So essentially, you have land to walk upon and you have a life to live because of the intense burning of the sun. If he cools off, 
this will become cold. So, the reason why he burns the way he burns and become the source of life is because he is nebulous, loose. Hello, hello, hello. No, I'm taking the battery cells to the last bar because they are not made like sun, nor are they s capturing solar energy. So I'm trying to, being the COVID times, we are economizing and everything. So uh, I thought we should run the batteries to the very last bar. So sorry for that one minute of... Uh, the rest of the world who are watching, wherever you are, didn't go into confusion, what happened, what happened? <laughs> the video is still on. So the sadhana is about changing your form. Right now, your form is largely restricted to your physical form and your psychological form. If you change this form beyond physiological and psychological processes, then you are transforming. Transformation essentially means you want to change the form that you are. Uh, I know in the United States it's not a popular thing to say you lose your form or you become out of form. Not a popular thing to say, but I'm not talking about your physical body. Uh, you can remain zero in your body size, whatever zero means. In my understanding, zero means non-existent. But people claim they're zero. Maybe they're talking about their mental structure. I'm getting into trouble, I know, <laughs> it's okay. But uh, zero is also infinite. So your form has to change. Changing your form means if you really have to transform, see you can make changes with your body. You can make changes with your mental structures, but transformation, can only happen upon the life, life process. That is, a form which is in transit is transforming, always. It must be transiting from its existing nature, always. If that is happening, then we say you are in a, mo in a mode of transformation, that every day is a new adventure, in terms of profoundness of experience, that your life is not mundane venture of transactions. Most people have made their life into a venture of transaction. You give me this, I'll give you this, what, I, what do I have, what do you have, how many things, how many flowers do I have, how many flowers do you have? No, they don't discuss flowers, it's usually money. Uh, <laughs> Everything is a transaction, so you're running a venture. Well, you will get a reward. Maybe we'll get you an Indian granite stone. I'm saying when you're dead. <laughs> or we will just burn you and spread the ashes to the trees. Better a living monument than a dead monument for you. Because there is no reward for this life. The only reward is life itself. 
because one who fails to see the phenomenal nature of what has been invested in us, for him, what reward? A stone is a reward? A heaven is a reward? Ah, what is there in heaven? Because this is nature's creation, here the imagination is limitless. You take and assimilate all the pieces of heaven from every religion on the planet. What is in heaven? Nobody, they don't even have a grasshopper. <laughs> Hello. No. In some heavens uh, there is food, heaps of food, in some heaven there are floating people, half-bodied, not even full-bodied. <laughs> and in some heaven there are pretty women, all right? But uh, no grasshopper, no chickens. <laughs> Nobody talked about a tree in heaven. Nobody talked about a flower in heaven. I don't think anywhere there's a description, please tell me if I'm wrong. I've never heard of a heaven which is flowers blossoming, fragrance coming, trees growing, new leaf bursting out. You know, have you seen the king cobras dancing? No cobras dancing? Oh, snakes not allowed in heaven. <laughs> so you have only rodents, is it? So, heaven is such a poor idea, made up in desperate minds, wanting to find some substance to a substanceless life. Because if you cannot get engaged with the tremendous phenomena that's happening here, <laughs> you will start inventing something to find meaning to your silly existence. Desperately searching for meanings. If you did not see the significance of the phenomena of life, both within and around you, then what meaning? Okay, you went to heaven, so what? Anyway, I told you, it doesn't even have as much variety of life and stuff as this planet has, which is just a tiny spot in the universe. So that kind of heaven, you go there and you're going to live happily ever after. There used to be these things in every movie. The end scene is man and woman will come together, hold hands happily ever after. Now both men and women are sufficiently disillusioned <laughs> that there is no happily ever after. If you want to be happy, you have to work hard from both ends. If you want to maintain some peace, you have to work hard, otherwise it's not going to happen. So sadhana is about this, about changing your form, changing the very form of your existence, so that you are always a transforming force. This transformation has to happen means you have at least have to transcend a few things. Transcending a few things means one thing, at least you must transcend the social media. Hello? Birds are tweeting, it's okay. You must transcend at least the need to bullshit the rest of the world for some time. Just… just learning to, you know, just sit quietly here. This much must happen, that you must become comfortable with this life. You don't have to mess with some life all the time. This much must happen for every life. If nothing great happens, at least this much must happen, that you must know how to be engaged and involved and enjoy the process of this life without messing around with any other life. Even if this doesn't happen, you haven't even started yet, that's what it means. So, twenty-one day sadhana will be av available, please uh, make use of it. 
Mm, I, as I said, considering mm, the virus times and the nature of accommodations we have to produce, uh, provide, uh, maybe together, both in India and here put together, we can offer a thousand people at a time. Mm, but protocols will be there. If you have questions, please. Namaskaram Sadhguru, in this age of Kali Yuga, Ooh. how would you introduce spirituality into corporate India? <laughs> because unfortunately I keep hearing this uh, in the… in that segment of people, there's a corporate world. So, well, this is a very important thing that we don't break the world into many pieces which we have already done in the name of race, religion, nationality, communities, caste, creed, now corporate world. Uh, this is also not new, class has always been there. Either money or lack of money has united people. Moneyed people gather in one place, no money people gather in another place. So, uh, that is what probably they're referring to as a world. <coughs> well, uh, different religions are claiming it is their world, you know. Now, classes are claiming their world. I don't know what else will claim. <laughs> no, there is a world. If you were a part of it, you would be a great contribution. But unfortunately, if you're not a part of it, you become exclusive. Exclusivity invariably brings exploitative tendencies in everybody. So, every economic system that you create, you talk about communism, you talk about socialism, you talk about capitalism, every system has become exploitative at certain point of success. Either exploiting the very people that they're supposed to take care of or exploiting somebody else who is not in the communist world or the socialist world or the capitalist world. Now, how to introduce spirituality to these people? Well, these people have found material success. That means in many ways, a few things, not everything about their life, a few things they've gotten logically correct. So, uh, it's very important that if spiritual process has to enter corporate world, it has to be logically correct. How to make a dimension which is nothing to do with the limitations of logic, logically correct, that's a challenge. Because logic is based on the principle of two. There must be this and that, then there is logic. There must be high and low, then there is logic. There must be you and me, then there is logic. Now you're talking about a dimension where there's only one number, either one or zero. In many ways, spirituality is a zero-sum game because it's one big hole. Who is here to cut this? This is not your birthday cake, to cut it into many pieces and serve it to people. It can't be done like that. 
Well, you're trying to do that in your mind, for that there is inevitable suffering that everybody is going through. So corporate world is also just one more piece of the cake, maybe the creamier part of the cake. Especially because there is more cream on their cake or their piece of the cake, they are little more, <laughs> you know. Generally, at least the men in the corporate world, oh, little noosed up. Because of that, even the breath is constipated. Because of that, very limited logic. First of all, human logic is a very limited process. Most human beings have not understood or grasped the basis of our logic and the limitations of our logic. This is why they're going on elogizing silly little things that they say. Well, uh, for this there is Indian masala. You know, haven't eaten anything. If you talk Indian masala, my mouth will water. <laughs> because not the kind that uh, Usha is serving or somebody else is serving in this kitchen. I have my masala, if you eat it, you will become my slave. Yes, uh, why the tongue? Your tongue will hang out and you'll be pointing at me all the time. Yes. <laughs> so, Indian masala is there, with which we can say most illogical dimension of life in a logical way. It's taken millennia of observation of human mind and the basis of human logic that for example, in an engineering program, all of you, many of you have gone through this. Uh, you do what you want, find one logical hole in it. You cannot, but we are saying the most illogical things. Because life is not contained in logic, life contains logic as a part of itself. But you cannot contain whole life into the logical process that happens in your mind. This is the big investment that the Western cultures have done, that they've invested too heavily in their own logic. They believe their logic will take them to the ultimate. No, for the first time, the physicists in the world, the top physicists in the world are admitting, we shall never know because we don't have instruments to know. This is a clear admission that Human logic cannot go beyond a certain point, it has its limitations. But this limited logic, we hash it up with Indian masala and use it to express the most illogical dimensions of life. <laughs> I must tell you this. <laughs> At one time when uh, this is a in mid-nineties, when uh, Isha as a movement in southern India was growing exponentially, <laughs> so uh, for the local people in Tamil Nadu, I'm somebody who landed up from somewhere, who doesn't know a word of Tamil, but bullying them with their own language, or saying all kinds of words which don't belong to Tamil but conveying what I want to convey. Even today I'm managing Tamil language with just thirty-three words of vocabulary. <laughs> then it was just eleven. <laughs> so saying all kinds of things but it was logically correct. So they were taken by it and it was just growing. The state government got little nervous, who is this guy? He just anywhere he goes, thousands of people gathering, what's happening? Is he going to start a new political party? Is he going to contest elections? All these kind of things came up. So it seems they sent some intelligence officers to our programs. <laughs> Maybe here also, I don't know if you're FBI. <laughs> <laughs> so they came and they did uh, the inner engineering program, 
then unfortunately they got into the Bhavaspandana program <laughs> and the horror of horrors, they got into the Samyama program <laughs> and then they submitted a report. After almost two years after this report was submitted, we found some access to the report because we didn't even know such a thing had happened. <laughs> So these guys who reported, to put it in a brief form, they said, this first program is very good. <laughs> you know what they mean. What they mean is, it's logically correct. Second program is little crazy, but all right. Third program, this must be banned. Because without doing anything, they're just sitting there and going crazy. <laughs> Not doing anything, at least in the second program, they were doing something to go crazy. In the third program, they're doing nothing and they're going crazy, this must be banned. So, <laughs> when I came to know of this, I thought this is a classic case of observation. <laughs> it has to be logically correct. Tell me, is your existence logically correct? In the middle of nowhere, you don't know where this cosmos begins, where it ends, in the middle of nowhere, you're sitting on a little mud ball called earth. It's just a tiny little mud ball. And uh, thinking up all kinds of things sitting here. And whoever comes here, we call them an alien, aliens have come. We are a microscopic, super microscopic existence, but any other life is alien to us. So this is our logic. It's absolutely illog illogical. Your very existence is illogical. There's simply no logic to your existence. We are trying to find meanings, no meaning. So, of course, with the corporate people, you have to say, uh, you will be peaceful because they are never peaceful. And they're telling me about 120,000 corporate leaders or in the executive uh, group of people, managers and executives in United States are dying much earlier than they should. And about 180 billion dollars is being spent on just corporate executive help in this country. Why are they so sick? It's very natural. When you have a world of your own, you will be sick, I want you to understand. We not only have a world of our own, we also have separate heavens. You should see on the golf courses, people keep on arguing, there is a golfer's heaven. Golfers go to a different heaven <laughs> where it's full of golf courses. <laughs> Sex maniacs go to another place, foodies go to another place. <laughs> separate heavens are also there, just like the separate worlds that we have created. So, corporate world, whether in India or elsewhere, they want something which is logically correct, but still takes them ahead. Well, you know we got the solution in engineering, hundred percent logically correct. Pick a hole in it, let me see. You cannot, because it's so logically perfect. <laughs> it's like Indian masala. If you taste all the ingredients separately and the final product, the final product doesn't resemble anything that you have put into it. So, it's like I'm calling it Indian masala because in the end it works. <laughs> and that's all that matters <laughs> Please. <laughs> Namaskaram Sadhguru. The United States response to the pandemic has clearly exposed the many shortfalls of this generation. In many ways, it seems, at least initially, that we may be the first generation in this country's history to not rise to the challenges it faces. 
Is there any hope for Americans? And how, with such a blatant disregard for the importance of human life, can we turn this country in a spiritual direction? It seems so far away. You're throwing one challenge after another to me, <laughs> how to turn India's corporate into <laughs> spiritual process, how to turn People who are not concerned about their life, not out of dispassion, because their passions are entangled so badly that it'll take away their lives. Well, we must understand, if you... Uh, I'm sure every one of you have seen something. If you look at, uh, let's say, the Wild West movies, Many of them are timed between 1850 to 1900. That means just a little over 120, 130 years or 150 years at the most. If you look at America of the time, how it was and what they made out of it today. Well, there are many ecological issues, all that, all that is fine. But as a nation, how it built itself, how it organized itself has not happened out of fanciful thinking. A few generations of people toiled. Day and night they toiled with absolute dedication to creating something which nobody thought was possible to put such a large mass of land into one nation. Well, cruel things have been done, yes, but still you have a nation organized to a certain level of performance and well-being. I don't know, I'm, I'm not very good on American history. <laughs> I'm trying to read some right now. Uh, whoever, who said, uh, ask not what the nation can give for you or... What? Hey, the Lebanese, the Palestinian and Lebanese people will say it came from there. Everything came from there, <laughs> all the troubles. <laughs> Is it true Khalil Gibran first said it? Is John F. Kennedy who said that? Not further back, not Abraham Lincoln or somebody. Okay. So uh, whoever said this, it matters. Maybe it came from Lebanon or Palestine, probably. So, uh, a generations of people who did not ask what they can get, but talked about what they can do for the nation, from there, we have come to a generation born into comfort, born into too much technological conveniences. Uh, this happened. This happened early twentieth century, a man went to England. So he met somebody and then in the conversation that person mentioned, aristocrats, we have aristocrats, do you have aristocrats in America? Then the American guy asked, what is an aristocrat? Oh, you don't know what's an aristocrat? Aristocrat means they don't have to work for their survival, Everything comes to them, they live on other people's work. Oh, in America we call them hobos <laughs> They don't do any work, <laughs> they live on other people's work <laughs> So, unfortunately, from a hard-working America, uh, a lot of them are becoming hobos. So no wonder they're even talking about changing the economic system which demands you need to perform at some level to a welfare system where everybody can... You can wear your mask and smoke, <laughs> you know. The moment you use the word freedom in your lexicon, you must understand this you will become irresponsible. 
responsibility should have been the word. Unfortunately, a generation picked up freedom, freedom. Freedom means what? I will do what I like. If every one of us do whatever I please, well, we will have a disaster, which we are having unfortunately right now. Where some world leaders are going out to describe United States as a primitive society. If you have not seen the news, some people are saying this. Because unfortunately, it is happening. People are dying in thousands per day. But people are saying, I want to have my haircut. I have lived without a haircut for so long, hello? <laughs> Think what's happened to us? Like one girl came on the television from, I don't know, some university in Texas, young girl. She said, uh, the problem right now in the universities, Budweiser is more important than their grandmother's life. That is a real problem. I think she in many ways she captured uh, the unfortunate spirit of the young people in America right now. I wouldn't say every one of them, but a whole lot of them. See, there are times to sit back and enjoy a few fruits of life. There are times to stand up and do the right things. If you don't know which is which time, then you will be a disaster. Unfortunately, a certain segment is going that way from three, four generations of really hard-working people who built this nation from nothing, from scratch to this point, now people who are here don't know how to live, don't know how to respect all the life's toil the generations of people have put in. Generations of people have just worn their life out to build this nation. But today, you don't even have basic respect for them to preserve and nurture and enhance it further. If that is missing, unfortunately you're unworthy. Right now, uh, don't be insulted, in the universities at least, I've been visiting many universities as part of Youth and Truth, many professors have told me, the only hard-working students in the universities are either Indians, Chinese, Jewish children, very small band of Americans. Well, they also may be Americans, I'm saying, because they have other appellations, Asian American, Indian American, whatever, whatever. Those people who call themselves American in the university, they're not doing great in most universities. Well, this is because we have bred this culture of freedom. No, you need to breed the culture of responsibility. Where there is no responsibility, there will be no freedom. Freedom will be go away. Where is your freedom? When people around you are falling dead, you must have a haircut. Where is your freedom, I'm asking? You're enslaved. You must go out and, you know, have parties secretly. And half the people in the parties are infected. Where is your freedom? You are terribly compulsive. It is time the American youth stand up, at least respect the previous generations for what they have toiled for and what they have created as a nation. It doesn't matter, there may be many... I can have a list of criticisms about America, but still, in many ways, almost the whole world aspires to become like that. There's no question about that. Well, we can have a list of negative things about America. Yes, there are about every nation, but the important thing is, a whole lot of people would like to come and live here. That means they're aspiring for this. So, don't waste your time just trying to see the negative underbelly of every nation. Every society has its ugly underbelly, always. But still, what somebody creates in terms of positive nature, 
needs to be appreciated, preserved, nurtured, enhanced. We don't even have the sense and sensitivity that somebody else's life may be at risk if I don't wear a mask and blow my cigarette smoke in their face. That much sense we must have. Unfortunately, in the name of freedom, we are losing our sense. This question is from Harsh, from Agra. Namaskaram Sadhguru, it has taken nearly three decades to resolve the Ram Janma dispute. With Ram Mandir Bhumi Puja just days away, there is a lot of excitement in Ayodhya. Even though Ram was a king, why is he worshipped even today? I want to understand how Ram is relevant in today's times. <laughs> well, uh, because he's from Agra, he's calling him Ram. Where we are from, we call him Rama. So we will not give up that uh. in case somebody just forgets that I'm South Indian, because looking at my name, some people think I'm a Punjabi <laughs> My name and my <laughs> name and my main, both, they think I must be a Punjabi. No, no, we call him Rama. I won't go further down to Tamil Nadu and call him Raman, then people will be confused. They may be think that I'm talking about somebody else. Rama, see this is the beauty of this culture, that there is no the God. There are qualities that we recognize as divine. If some human being displays that, we bow down to him because we are bowing down to the quality, not to the person. This is something that most of the world will not understand because they've been psyched with very dogmatic religions. What is God, what is devil, what is man, what is woman, everything is clearly defined. In India, nothing is defined because, you know, I told you, Masala, everything is like that, always evolving, always things happening. This costs a lot of life and energy to keep yourself disorganized and still move in one direction. But this is like a, a swarm of uh, starlets or like a swarm of bees. They, it looks like they're going nowhere, but they're always going somewhere, they know where they're going. But for an outside observer, it looks like they're going nowhere. So you must understand this. Ram or Rama, is from Ayodhya, which is where the temple construction is happening because it's his birthplace. The temple is few thousand years old. Nobody knows exactly first temple, what age it came up. Then developments happened, developments happened over millennia. But about five hundred years ago, it was demolished. Systematically, lot of temples were demolished upon which other religious places were built with the same, using the same construction material. Pull down this and build something else out of it. So, Rama being an icon, you must understand, he is an icon, not a god. Because we did not call him a god, we called him Maria the Purush, Purushottam, that means an elevated man. The very word, Purushottam means an elevated man. Rama is always referred to as Purushottama. That means among the men, he is above them because he is so elevated. What is so elevated about him? Well, he went through trials and tribulations, I will not go through the whole works, but series of disasters, serial disaster, his life. 
he loses his kingdom, loses his wife, has to fight a war, then comes back, again loses his wife, loses his children, almost killed his children, endless number of disasters. Through all this, he goes through peacefully, blissfully, pain, but still blissful. On one level, on a personal level, he has much pain which he expresses, but he never allows that pain to make any decisions about anything that he is doing. Well, when a man acts like this, we say he is purushottama, because he is uttama means an elevated one among the men. It's very important that he is a man. He was born in Ayodhya and died at a certain age and went through all this life traveled through Indian geography, coming down to south and again going back to north. After having killed his adversary, a man who kidnapped his wife and was living and ruling wantonly, after killing him, he comes back and goes into a year of repentance. So his brother asks, are you crazy? This is the worst kind of guy, you had to kill him. And now, you want to repent? What does it mean? Did we all do wrong? So Rama said, see, there are many negative things about this Ravana. But he was a great devotee and he was a great administrator of his kingdom. He exploited everybody else for which I had to kill him. But he was a great devotee. For that I am repenting that I killed a devotee. Well, this man needs to be emulated and it's very important that he is a man. If he becomes a god, you will hang him on the wall and forget about him. Nobody tries to ever emulate a god, you must understand this. God means is beyond emulation. That is the idea of human mind. A man means, if he is doing really wonderful, naturally there is an aspiration in everybody, why can't I be like this? So it's extremely important that he is a man, he was a king, he lost his kingdom and again came back and walked away from all the wealth and pomp of his kingdom just because somebody else was upset. His stepmother was little upset and she was doing little kuchu kuchu behind his back. She said, if this is what you want, I will leave. Well, this man needs to be emulated. When people are hanging on to power like crazy today, no matter what, even if they lose the election, they don't want to go. At a time like this, emulating Rama is very, very, very important. So why is this temple important? The temple is important because in many ways, at least in the northern part of the country, in south, uh, not so much, it is very much there but not so much. But in the north, Rama is their spirit. And five hundred years ago, when foreign invaders from Turkey and some from Mongolia later on, they came and they systematically went about destroying all the temples, which were ancient temples built long time ago, which was the fundamental force for that society, and put up whatever they wanted to put up hurriedly on top of it. This dispute has been raging. This dispute has been in the court for, I think, if I'm correct, about 135 years since the British era. It has been in the court and going on and on and on. Because we have developed a certain kind of wanting to be politically correct at any cost, unfortunately, in the country, no judge has been wanting to take a call on it. Everybody is pushing it so that his term is over, let the next one handle the trouble. Because uh, two communities are fiercely contesting as to whose property is it. But now the Supreme Court, after a, lo a long process of nearly three to four decades in the Supreme Court, it's been going on, now it came to a conclusion, looking at all the proof, clearly, archaeological proof, clearly, clearly more than hundred percent it suggests 
that there was a temple and it was pulled down, uh, hurriedly they put up a building on top of it. Uh, so they said, this must be built as temple. For the other community, they gave, allotted another piece of land close by, within twenty miles or I mean twenty kilometers or something like that. They said, you build your place there, let them build their place here. So it is not just another temple, it's a resurrection of India's spirit. Because it is not just one particular denomination or religion who looks up to Ram. There's a whole lot of people, whole lot of uh, people who belong to other religions who also want to emulate him, who also elogize him in many, many ways. So in many ways, Ram, Ramayan, the story of Ram has been so much a part of Indian ethos. So it is almost like a resurrection of a damaged national spirit. So uh, I think it's a good thing it's happening because uh, otherwise unnecessary hatreds against other communities will continue with this resolution, a whole lot of minds and hearts are cooler, which is a good thing for the future of the nation and unnecessarily frictions going on endlessly between two communities. So I think one major problem has been settled. So on 5th of August, they're laying the foundation stone and they're planning to build a grand temple, probably in record time because in the last twenty-five, thirty years, I think, they have uh, carved all the pillars, you know, the columns, this, that, everything, whatever the stone part of the work, stonework part has been all kept ready, stored somewhere else and they will just have to assemble that. The rest of the structure should come up pretty fast. Hopefully, in twenty-four months or thirty months, this grand temple will be up. And uh, because of the virus situation, they have sent out only hundred and fifty invites. Otherwise, probably ten million people would be there, ten to twelve million people would be there for this opening of the temple or even foundation laying, but only hundred and fifty invites are uh, <laughs> sent out. So rest is uh, being live telecast, people can see it on the television or maybe it's webcast, I don't know. So uh, I think it's... I think it's a landmark in terms of resolving disputes which continue for a long time, unnecessarily festering in a society like a wound. I think it should cool down many people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now that you asked Ram question, hmm? Yeti Rugananu Daya Chuchadava Inavam Shottam Rama Etiru Gananu Daya Chuchadava Inavam Shottam Rama Natarama Bhava Sagarami Dhanu Nalina Dhalekshana Rama Natarama Bhava Sagarami Dhanu Nalina Dhalekshana Rama Shri Ragunandana Sita Ramana Sthritajana Poshak Rama Shri Ragunandhana Sita Ramana Sthritajana Poshak Rama Karunyalaya Bhaktavaradhaninu Kannadi Kanupurama Karunyalaya 
ಭಕ್ತವರದ ನೀನು ಕನ್ನದಿ ಕಾನು ಪುರಾಮ ಕ್ರೂರ ಕರ್ಮ ಮುಲು ನೇರಕ ಚೇಸಿತಿ ನೇರ ಮುಲಂಚ ಕುರಾಮ ಕ್ರೂರ ಕರ್ಮ ಮುಲು ನೇರಕ ಚೇಸಿತಿ ನೇರ ಮುಲಂಚ ಕುರಾಮ ಧಾರಿದ್ರ್ಯಮು ಪರಿಹಾರಮು ಸಂಯವೇ ದೈವ ಶಿಕಾಮಣಿ ರಾಮ ಧಾರಿದ್ರ್ಯಮು ಪರಿಹಾರಮು ಸೈಯವೇ ದೈವ ಶಿಕಾಮಣಿ ರಾಮ ವಾಸವನುಥ ರಾಮದಾಸ ಪೋಷಕ ವಂದನ ಮಯೋಧ್ಯ ರಾಮ ವಾಸವನುತ ರಾಮದಾಸ ಪೋಷಕ ವಂದನ ಮಯೋಧ್ಯ ರಾಮ ದಾಸಾರ್ಚಿತ ಮಾಕಭಯ ಮು ಸಂಘವೇ ದಾಶರತಿ ರಘು ರಾಮ ದಾಸಾರ್ಚಿತ ಮಾಕಭಯ ಮು ಸಂಘವೇ ದಾಶರತಿ ರಘು ರಾಮ 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 these qualities of rama if we have to encapsulate it his passion for the well-being of his people was limitless to a point of self sacrifice which is uh, eulogized in so many ways through ramayan so essentially absolute passion for everything total dispassion for myself this is what he encapsulates i think uh, this is a quality all human beings need to emulate no matter where they are Laris is testing you to see how dispassionate are you about are you about yourself and how passionate are you about every other life Laris is checking no way to escape you know you can't bull yourself out of it this happened in texas an officer from the fbi uh because they were suspecting people may be growing illegal some time ago illegal when it was still illegal to grow marijuana illegal drugs they are growing and making money out of it so an officer came to a ranch were an old man over 70 years of age but very fit and hard working man and he said i want to come and check your ranch if you are growing any illegal plants which are hallucinogenic other ah, old timer said uh, no we are not growing anything like that we just have cattle and this and that but no illegal something no no i need to check 
He said, uh, okay, you're free to check wherever you want, except that one place he showed a patch of land and he said, just don't go there. <laughs> so the officer got livid. You telling me where I should go and where I should not go? Do you know who I am? And he pulled out his badge, said, the FBI, I'm FBI, I'm a senior investigator. You telling me where I should go and where I should not go, with this badge I can go wherever I want to go. The old timer said, okay, I'm sorry, you can go wherever you want to go. Then after some time, he heard, the rancher heard wild, desperate cries. Then from the direction where that patch of land was, then he looked, then he saw the officer running crazies for his life with this super stud bull chasing him. <laughs> then the old man ran to the fence, stood on the fence pole and he said, show him the badge, show him the badge. <laughs> Please, uh, don't flash your entitlements in the face of the virus, it's non-discriminatory. <laughs>